I would like you to keep your minds open because this is going to be uh, somewhat of a long journey. Today I would like to talk about four major problems that I see in 21st century medicine. <coughs> and I would actually like to suggest a very specific solution that will alleviate most of these problems. In fact, I hope that by the end of my talk, you will agree with me that the computer is the patient's best friend. Some of you might have heard Dr. Atul Gawande's talk at TED Talk, an excellent TED Talk, on how to heal 21st century medicine. They should be especially interested in this extension of these ideas. So, what are the four problems? First, the portion of elderly population is increasing as we speak. Second, the cost of medical health care is actually going up and spiraling and literally makes your head spin. <laughs> <laughs> the quality of health care, unfortunately, is not <coughs> as good as we would like it to be. And in fact, health care quality is somewhat variable and not as shiny as we would like it to be. And finally, I'm rather concerned with the fact that patients are not involved in therapy as much as I would like them to be and often have no support for making difficult choices. So let me briefly go over these problems before focusing on the solution. The population is getting older. In fact, I'm sorry to tell you, all of you guys are aging by a rate of one minute per minute, as I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, in eight years, a quarter of the world's population is going to be older than 65 years. Now, many of these patients are going to be chronic disease patients having diabetes or hypertension. That also means high costs, because for example, in the USA, 25% of the patients are considered as chronic, but they consume 75% of the healthcare resources. Which leads me to the next problem. The cost of healthcare has been spiraling throughout the world. You can see it especially in the case of the USA, where it has already reached close to 20% of the gross domestic product. This has also taken a toll on the annual cost for American families that has been spiraling as well, and it's currently around $20,000 per family. But this growth in costs is not necessarily accompanied by a growth in the quality of care. In fact, I'm rather sorry for this green picture, but it is a fact that more than 100,000 patients in the US die annually because of preventable medical errors. Now, why is there such a lack of quality? Well, in fact, the quality problem is really due to high variance in care. Physicians <coughs> sometimes make excellent decisions, and sometimes they make decisions that wouldn't be worse. And that is mostly due to two problems. One is there is too much data. Just think of all these chronic patients that they are taking care of sometimes for 30 or 40 years. But there is also too much medical knowledge. Because what happens is that data accumulates over time. And at the same time, medical research, which is an excellent uh, adventure to pursue, generates too much knowledge for most physicians to access. Next, I would like to point out that I'm concerned with the fact that patients are not involved enough in their therapy. Either they have no say at all about their treatment, and basically they are led blindly by their care provider wherever they may go, or they are sometimes faced with too many choices, called in the USA informed consent, which is neither informed nor <coughs> expressing any autonomous consent because the patient does not have the means to decide what to do and is left at the quandary as to what to really do. Now, there seems to be a white knight waiting in the wings that could save us, and that's called clinical guidelines. It's the best of medical practice, and these guidelines are published by medical societies every year, and they are the essence of the results of medical research. They're, they have shown to enhance the quality of care and make it more uniform when used, and they have also shown to reduce the costs of care. In fact, uh, Dr. Atul Gawande's talk mentioned checklists, and that's a form of a very simple <coughs> guideline. But guidelines are only useful if they are accessible at the point of care. 
and if they are actually being followed. So in the seven or eight minutes that the physician has, guidelines are typically not accessible and cannot be followed. So we have four different problems, and we have one potential solution, which is the correct application of medical care at the right time and the right place, which can enhance the quality of care, reduces costs, and even involve patients. Now, can we actually make medical knowledge accessible whenever we need it at the right time and place? Can we also apply it correctly? Well, at the risk of sounding like a presidential candidate, the answer is yes, we can. <laughs> and the answer involves a 21st century creation, which is medical knowledge engineering using computers. You see, I think that the computer is really the patient's best friend. Now, to the heart of hearing, the computer is the patient's best friend. It is an objective agent that can represent the patient's preferences, can remember exactly what clinical knowledge is relevant to that patient and what the patient's data are, and apply the knowledge to the data in an objective manner without any human bias. So computers can do much more than just store clinical data. They can also represent medical knowledge. They can monitor patients at home or at the hospital. They can also apply the medical knowledge to the patient's data. They can alert the patients. They can advise their care providers using the best guidelines. They can customize these guidelines to include the patient's preferences, and they can help researchers discover new knowledge. All of this is done, as we speak, at Ben-Gurion University's Medical Informatics Research Center. Now, how do we do that? Well, in our laboratories, medical, expert, med medical experts typically collaborate with what we call knowledge engineers, which are computer scientists trained in representing human knowledge in a computer to create medical knowledge bases, which are computer programs that represent knowledge. On the other hand, we have access to clinical data, and we create decision support systems which integrate the data, such as physical examinations and laboratory data of the patient, with the relevant medical knowledge in order to support, on one hand, therapy at the point of care, and on the other hand, analyze large masses of data for research and policy making using exactly the same knowledge base. Now you might wonder, how do we transform the world's clinical textual knowledge into a set of computer programs? Let me show you just a glimpse. To start with, we create a knowledge map. I'm showing you here an example of the concept of preeclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy, which means high blood pressure during pregnancy. It's actually defined based on several <coughs> different other concepts, such as high <coughs> blood pressure, and you can actually see the original text of the guideline, and on the left-hand side, a particular small fragment of a program. So let me actually zoom to make it clear. If we want to represent what is high blood pressure, we see in the guideline that it means either systolic blood pressure more than 140 or diastolic blood pressure over 90, and we actually represent it as a set of constraints. On the other hand, we can also represent the flow of the guideline as a protocol in a computer and represent a very complex guideline such as for treating preeclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy. And again, if I will zoom into one part of this protocol, you will see that here we are actually representing explicitly the decision what to do with the patient depending on the severity of her condition. So this creates a global digital library of clinical guidelines. Next question might be, can you really represent all of the world's guidelines and actually apply them correctly at the point of care? Well, at the risk of sounding again like a presidential candidate, yes, we can. There are only about 5,000 clinical guidelines representing the core medical knowledge in the world, <coughs> and these can be represented within a computer and can be applied. And I'm sure, because we have in fact succeeded in representing much of that knowledge already 
and applying it in multiple ways. Let me show you that the sky is the limit. To start with, we represented the knowledge of monitoring oncology patients and evaluated an interface that allows physicians to browse the data of oncology patients after bone marrow transplantation in the Palo Alto healthcare system, which is run by the Veterans Administration Hospital. And physicians could ask questions about various concepts. They could browse over time raw clinical data. They could look at intermediate interpretations that use the knowledge. They could even look at the overall pattern <coughs> that is formed by the patient's data. Did this help them make better decisions? You bet it did. They actually saved a few minutes per query each time they needed to ask a question that was relevant to the clinical protocol. In fact, in the case of the hardest queries, they saved about five minutes per query per patient. And that savings of time also translates to saving of cost. Now, they did not lose any accuracy during that time because, in fact, their accuracy has risen from 57% without the computer to 92% with the computer, so we also have our quality. Next we ask, can we do that for 100,000 patients? Apply the same knowledge base for <coughs> the whole population. So we created a very similar interface in which we have actually created a browsing interface for a huge population. And again, we can see that we have a browser, concept search, but this time we can look at whole subject groups. And we can ask questions about the raw data, and we can also apply the medical knowledge, and this time we get a whole distribution of patterns in the population, and they change during the year, so we can monitor a population. That turned out to be a very useful tool for clinical researchers and policymakers. Then we asked, can we also apply it to monitor real patients and diagnose them? So we turned to the intensive care unit, and we created a knowledge map for representing common infections. And if I zoom into a part of it, we see problems in gas exchange, and you can see the original text of the guideline that they were created from. So this is a knowledge map for common infections. And here is an interface that we created so that our computational tools that use the knowledge base can output the result to the physicians. It's a very simple but effective interface. Each patient has a small window and several different infections. A green light says everything is fine for this infection. A red light says we have detected a pattern of infection for this patient. And blue light says there is a suspicion of an infection, but I need more data, such as a missing x-ray. So that was quite useful. And so we wondered if we can also output specific recommendations to the physicians that will change their behavior. So we turned back to our favorite subject, preeclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy which as you remember involves high blood pressure during pregnancy, and we actually recruited 36 obstetricians. And we simulated six different clinical scenarios for this guideline, which turned out to involve 60 different clinical decisions. Now, every physician was faced by two situations. Half of the time, just the patient record, actually on a computer screen, without any help from us, and half of the time, the physician actually got support from our computer program. So all he had to do was agree or reject our suggestion. And of course, we checked whether their actions were according to the best practice guideline that their hospital prescribes. The results were surprising even to us. First, we looked at what portion of the physician's actions were correct. This is called correctness. Well, it turned out to be 32% without the computer, 99% with the computer. Next, we wondered, it's not enough that most of your actions are correct. I want you to also execute all of the guideline. That is called completeness or adherence to the guideline. Now, it turned out that without the computer system, they fulfilled 47% of the relevant instructions of the guideline relevant to that scenario. But with the computer, they adhere to 93% of the relevant guideline prescriptions. So if you are not using an intelligent computer system, you are placing a heavy bet against the odds. Finally, we put it all together 
in a large European project that is currently running <coughs> called Mobili, involving five countries and 13 industrial and academic partners, where we monitor patients through their smartphone. They have bodily sensors for heart rate, for blood pressure, for blood glucose, and more, and they broadcast them through the smartphone into our servers, where we analyze them using medical knowledge and send back alerts, suggestions, further questions to the patients. And at the same time, we send recommendations to their care providers straight to their smartphone or to their desktop computer. And finally, we close the loop by putting together the physicians and the patients. Obviously, this is much cheaper when you monitor a patient at home than actually visiting the clinic every day or every week. On the other hand, it's not just cheaper, it's also much higher quality of care because the patients are monitored 24 seven and the best guidelines are continuously applied to them. So I hope that what you got from my talk today is the message that unlike what you're sometimes being told, which is that computers actually obstruct communication between patients and physicians. The physician is just looking at the screen of the computer. It's actually the other way around. We can save a lot of time for information processing, leaving a lot of time to the physician to actually talk to the patient and care about them. We can prevent a lot of errors because to err is human. And we have shown you, I hope, in a very conclusive way that we can enhance the quality of care, we can reduce its costs, and we can empower patients to play a much larger role in their own care, all using computers. So I hope you agree with me now that the computer is really the patient's best friend. Thank you.